Hey everybody, it's Kelly. Welcome back to another episode of Ask a Therapist. Today's video is a little bit different. I have preempted some of my coming videos in order to bring this one to you as soon as possible. Recently, Hulu released a documentary entitled God Forbid. The documentary itself follows the downfall of Liberty University's former president, Jerry Falwell Jr., how that happened, how that's connected to Christian nationalism, and how that's connected to elections and former presidents. So there's a little bit of informing I want to do, a little bit of unpacking that I want to do, and also a little bit of processing that I would like you to do with me. Politics might not be your thing and you might be very tempted to turn this video off. I would encourage you to not because I think you need to hear what I have to say. Let's start with a rundown of what the movie is about. The movie is largely narrated by many of the big players, but it's obviously one-sided and it's the one side telling their story. It's John Carlo, who was the young man who was involved in this three-person affair in the Falwell marriage and it's it's his story. It, just to make sure we're all on the same page, Jerry Falwell Jr. is the son of Jerry Falwell, who was the founder of Liberty University, arguably one of the most notorious evangelists in, in the, the history, history of the U.S. US. And I say notorious and not necessarily famous because notorious is a little more sinister. And I personally believe Jerry Falwell Sr. was pretty sinister. He's very open about his opinions about women being in the workforce. He was very open about his opinions that gay and lesbian people caused 9-11. He said, yeah, because so many gay people died in it. That was obvious. And he also said that as a country, because we have become so complacent in allowing gay people to exist that that was then the punishment on the country there's a lot of other inflammatory things that he has said you can look all of it up i'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on here on him because he's such a small piece to this puzzle but he is important and he is where it started he had a bunch of kids his son jerry jr ended up coming back to the university when it was in a ton of financial trouble and helped to bring it out of financial ruin at the time and made it into arguably the most powerful university in the nation maybe even in the world and i say powerful because jerry falwell senior was known as a kingmaker from the time that liberty university was founded it was founded originally as a school k2 college as a way for white people to not have to have their kids go to school in desegregated schools. After the founding of it, throughout time, all of the successful Republican candidates for president launched their platforms from Liberty University. They received either an implicit or explicit endorsement from Liberty University and went on to succeed. A couple of years into his time at Liberty University, Jerry Falwell Jr. and his wife Becky had gone to a resort in Miami. And while at the resort, one of the people who was attending the pool and attending the people who were going to the pool, not a pool boy, by the way, though he was 20 years old. Becky found him attractive and ended up inviting him up to the room, said my husband wants to watch us have sex. He's a 20 year old boy. She is an attractive woman. He's like, sure, why not? Whatever. He has no idea who they are. Okay, so Jerry decides to buy a company. He has Giancarlo become part of it and he guarantees him all the success and all this wealth and everything as long as he keeps sleeping with his wife. Sooner or later, the three of them just sort of become embroiled in this like sexual relationship. There's no indication that Giancarlo and Jerry follow ever had sex together, the two of them, they very clearly shared Becky a number of times. When Giancarlo is closing these real estate deals and everything for the Falwells, he enlists the help of a father and son duo, the last name of Fernandez, that help him to secure this location, it ends up being a youth hostel, and they try to close the deal. The Fernandez family notices that all of a sudden Giancarlo has all this money and they're flying him in on private planes, and they're like, why is this very well-known couple spending all this time and all this money on this guy who has nothing to do with him, who grew up in a predominantly Cuban neighborhood outside of Miami and for all intents and purposes had no reason to ever interact with them at all. So they connect the dots. The real estate deal closes and then they serve Giancarlo and Jerry Falwell papers with a lawsuit alleging that Giancarlo at one point said they'd go 50-50 on the equity. Everyone else says that didn't happen. There's a lot of back and forth about the lawsuit. Giancarlo says, Jerry, what are we going to do? Jerry enlists the help of this man named Michael Cohen, who you might recognize the name of as a fairly infamous, at one point, right-hand man of Donald Trump prior to his 2016 presidential bid. Anyway, so he enlists Michael Cohen, and Michael Cohen makes the lawsuit just go away. So John Carlos like, like, okay, wait, uh, I don't know where it went, but it doesn't matter because it's gone. In the statement, in order to settle the lawsuit, in order to make it go away, Jerry tells the lawyer that John Carlo had a crush on Becky, and that that's all that ever was. It's about 2015, and Jerry calls up John Carlo and says, I have been asked to give an endorsement for Trump, and we would love 
love to get you up here to meet him and all this kind of stuff, right? Let's be involved. It turns out that Michael Cohen got this proof of this affair from this family and was allegedly blackmailing Jerry Falwell to do the endorsement of Trump because you get somebody that you can puppet and put them in front of the Liberty crowd, get Jerry Falwell to endorse him, and now you've got the evangelical vote. Backing up, there was a ton of drama about desegregation, right? There was also at the same time a ton of drama about Roe v. Wade. The evangelical think tank called, wait for it, the moral majority? Have you heard that before? That's Jerry Falwell's baby from back in the 70s. He has this group that is just kind of watching what's going on, just sort of like politically analyzing and everything. And the Catholic Church really went up in arms about the Roe v. Wade decision. They put a ton of backing behind Republican candidates for Congress all over the nation and turned Congress around for conservative votes. Seeing this, Falwell and the Moral Majority join up with the pro-life rally. They start to talk about how abortion is the worst thing to happen in this country. Because, again, abortion is more acceptable to talk about than I don't want my white kid sitting next to a black kid in school. Either way, you cannot ignore the fact that abortion is a classist problem. Falwell endorses Trump, which everyone is very aware he was probably going to do anyway. But Cohen, in his book later, in taped conversations with people, he said that he used that as insurance to have Jerry endorse Trump, knowing that would win them the election. Trump wins the election in 2016. We see the rise of a whole lot of things over the next four years. We see Christian nationalism. We see exaggeration. We see lying to the press and no one's blinking an eye. We see all of this division and we see a president that is sowing these seeds of division over and over and over again to stay in power. John Carlo sees this from the inside. He watches what's happening across the nation. He watches the pandemic not make anything any better, make everything worse, and watches all of these things. And at some point, he has matured. He is regretting the relationship he had with Becky and with Jerry. And also, in July of 2020, Jerry settles with the Fernandez family and cuts Giancarlo out of the deal completely. So after requesting the money that he was owed and everything, he finally says, you know what? I'm going to go to the press, let the chips fall where they may. I am not going to allow Falwell to once again endorse Trump in the 2020 election because he will win again. And who knows where our country's going to be. From there, we know what happened. The scandal erupts. We've got picture of Jerry Falwell dressed in a completely inappropriate outfit going against everything that Liberty stands for. And he ends up resigning. That is what happened in the movie. Let's talk about what it means. You have heard me say, over and over and over again, that Christian nationalism is dangerous. And this proves it. This idea that you can rally everybody behind a candidate that is wholly unsuitable for office just because one very powerful evangelical leader endorses them is terrifying. Because who are they going to try to put in next? And who is going to endorse them? We are in an extraordinarily important midterm election season. And during this time, choices have to be made. The desire to gain political power in order to overturn Roe v. Wade goes back to the 70s immediately after it even happened. That ruling came down in 71, and these plans are documented into the 70s. The power of the media is all over this thing, implication-wise. And when you go back to the plans that Jerry Falwell Sr. had for the country, for his political aspirations, for Liberty University, he was very clear from the beginning. Women should never be in power. Women should not have rights. And white men should be in charge. And he was never shy about saying these things. He did, however, not ever, ever preach his first sermon about Roe v. Wade until 1981. This hot button evangelical Christian issue was so important, the leader of the evangelical church at that time thought it was so significant that he waited 10 whole years to preach a sermon on it. He preached every Sunday. I'm pretty sure it's 3,650 sermons. Let's say he took some time off. That's 3,000 sermons before he got around to it. Across the movie, they're constantly calling the Falwell couple predators. I'm going to push back on this a little bit. I would not classify them as predators only because John Carlo was an adult, and I believe to call them predators in that way would pull from the impact of the things that they did with minors, which is also documented. Fun fact, Jerry Falwell Jr. was 18 and Becky was 13 when they met and started dating. I'd say that's a predator. 
John Carlo was from a predominantly Cuban neighborhood in Miami. He was 20 years old. And at 20 years old, a woman, a very rich, very attractive woman, asked him to come up and of his own free will, he has sex with her while her husband hangs out in the corner. And then this goes on for years. For years, this goes on. He was, for most of the time, a willing, adult, consenting participant, but you cannot ignore the imbalance of power that existed in this situation. He was arguably far too young to actually understand what he was doing. I constantly wonder about this kind of stuff, and so I'm going to throw this up here and see what you think of it. Would the country have responded differently had Giancarlo been a woman? If this is a 20-year-old woman and Jerry had been the one sleeping with her while Becky was in the corner and they had sort of a threesome thing going on from then, would this have been seen as better or worse? When you have three consenting adults who clearly have a kink, kink shaming is really inappropriate. That's not what I intend to do here. Three consenting adults knew whatever they want to do. I don't really care. The problem comes in when one of those adults is making his entire fortune, his entire legacy, and an entire country on the belief that he is this pure and wholesome person. They wrote this thing at Liberty called the Liberty Way, and they were all of the things that you were not allowed to do. You weren't allowed to drink alcohol. You weren't supposed to be having sex. At some point, you weren't supposed to be going to movies. There were so many things you were not allowed to do, and yet he was doing all of those things because no one could stop him, because he was powerful and he didn't have to answer to anybody. And yet, he's shaping and molding an entire nation and helped to make Donald Trump, the president of the United States. The theme of victim blaming that we have talked about so many times when it comes to church and to the trauma that religion has caused is so thick in this. And the end of the movie, if y'all haven't watched it yet, just go in warned. The end of the movie, I was physically ill. A picture came out of Jerry Falwell and that picture caused him to take a leave of absence. He was going to be paid. They were going to send him to rehab. He was going to come back. Giancarlo's story comes out making it pretty clear that all three of them were consenting adults and involved in all of this and there were other underhanded things happening also related to at that point the current president. There's a board of directors meeting and Jerry decides he's going to resign aka he was told to resign. In his resignation, he has this to say. I don't want something my wife did to harm the university I spent my life building. His story was that Becky had the affair on him and he had no idea. He had no clue. Not even part of it. And even in his resignation, he couldn't resist throwing her under the bus. I would not necessarily call Becky a victim here. I really wouldn't. But to the outside observer... To this man who has been so important to so many people for so long, she becomes the villain and he walks away scot-free. This man has been drunk at convocation regularly. He's drunk at every public appearance, falling off of stools and slurring his words, and no one says anything to him about that. No one stops him. He's untouchable. In walks the Trump political machine, right? Because how many people have we seen that machine chew up and spit out? And then all of a sudden they're persona non grata. Do you know why Michael Cohen wrote his book? He wrote his book because after he secured Trump the endorsement of the Falwell family, he was taken off the payroll. And after Falwell fell from grace, he was then also removed from the Trump inner circle. It doesn't even stop there. There's this place on Liberty University's campus called the Falkirk Center. The Falkirk Center was made by Falwell and Kirk. And it was supposed to be some like political think tank thing. I don't know. Kirk from the Falkirk Center paid for multiple buses full of evangelical Christians to go to the January 6th rally. And of those Christians that he sent on these buses, those were the ones that were praying in the room after peeing on the floor of Congress and thanking God for protecting them and allowing them to do what was right. These are the people whose transportation and an ability to be there in general, Kirk paid for. This is still Liberty University being involved here. You have to go to grad school to be a counselor. I went to grad school at Liberty University. I went to grad school at Liberty. I signed the Liberty Way. I agreed to all these things. Meanwhile, being married to my wife. So, you know, whatever, I guess. But there's so many of us whose money is tied up in this somewhere. There's so many of us that went in to, for so many years of where we knew better, that helped this, this religious, evangelical, political machine take over the country while we all 
sang praise songs and went to conventions. I wish there was one person in this that we could just point to and say that person. That person is the bad one. Because when you can blame things on one person, on one specific entity or even one period of time, then you can put it in a box and you can put it away. You can't put this movement in a box. They have been very clear about their dislike of anyone in power who is not a white male. The information is out there. It is accessible to anyone with an internet connection right now. You can find this information out there. Once you've heard this information, you don't have a lot of excuses to ignore it. I know I'm going to get some pushback on this video. <laughs> it might be from some of the people that I went to Liberty with. I don't know. Usually when I talk about political things, I get pushback. Therapy is political. Therapy is about helping people to find a balance that generally society has screwed up in the first place. And if those of us in, in healing professions do not start making noise and calling attention to the inequity out there, I don't know what happens and I don't want to see what happens. So there you go. God forbid on Hulu. Check it out. Drop some comments. Let me know what you think. Ask questions if you have questions. And that's it for today. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you all next week. Until then, take care of yourselves and each other. 